Listen, before we jump into the word, I want to start with this video, so go ahead and roll it. When How I Met Your Mother first went on the air, I ran into an actress that I uh, knew, and she said, are you just like so happy all the time? Why am I unhappy? Okay. Okay, so Stephanie Gaga hybrid person. Why are you unhappy? Why is it that you want to quit music? And I remember thinking like, oh, that sitcom's coming. Like that sitcom, it's coming, it's coming. And when I got it, I mean, I won't say it was a depression, but you kind of go through a disappointment because it can't, it, that fame or that thing didn't satisfy the way you thought it was going to satisfy. I had bought into the not uncommon notion that when I taste success, when I get over there, then I'll be happy. But the strangest thing happened. As the show got more successful, I got more depressed. I thought it would be good to be rich and famous. It would be good to be the opposite of this. It would be good to have stuff. It would be good to have money. It would be good to be invited to the party. Well, I've been invited. I've been in. We're having this chat in a private Swish members club in East London. It's super cool. There's bare brick walls. Everyone's double good looking. But I've been inside now. I've seen the other side of the looking glass. It ain't f***ing worth it. It's not good. Don't feed your soul. I still feel empty inside. I had everything a man could want, even then. I had... I was a millionaire. I had a beautiful, beautiful women in my life. I had um, cars, a house, an incredible, uh, a solid gold career, and, and a future. And yet, on a daily basis, I wanted to commit suicide. As a Beatle, we made it, and there was nothing to do. We had money, we had uh, fame, and there was no joy. The media told me every day, and it's telling you every day, what it is to be successful. So you've got MTV Cribs, you've got billionaires in front of your face, you have these, these extrinsic, external goals that will say, oh, Tom Shadiak has arrived. He has the right house, the right car, he flies privately. And when I got there, it was empty. I was successful in the music business, I was successful in modeling, in television, in real estate. So I made all this money and I had all this success. And here I was going, Okay, I still don't feel any different. We are told that if we're beautiful, if we're skinny, if we're successful, famous, if we fit in, um, if everyone loves us, that we'll be happy. But that's not entirely true. Today I want to talk about the meaning of life. I entitled the message today, Chasing the Wind. I, 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 I really want to dig into what makes us happy. What, what gives us purpose? What, what fills, what, what satisfies the soul? And, and hear me, the reason why is because I think there's no denying it that each of us have all been created for meaning and fulfillment. There, there's this innate desire from the depths of our soul uh, for you and for me to walk with purpose, with significance, with happiness, with satisfaction. Now, the problem, though, is that, you know, as we just saw in that video, the world teaches us to try to find these things, to try to find meaning and happiness in, you know, what the world offers, in wealth, in, in materialism, in success, in, in comfort, in all these different things. But as we just saw, and, and what you may know is that all of these things, at the end of the day, they're all temporal, Right? It's all finite. It's all shallow in its own way. And relying on these things, uh, you know, to fill some sort of inner void, it just leaves us disappointed. Leaves us thirsting for more. It leaves us empty. And so therein lies this, like, profound mystery in life. That where do creatures of meaning and of fulfillment, where do we actually find this meaning and fulfillment? Well, if you search scripture, what you see is that this, this mystery, it's nothing new. In fact, uh, you don't have to look far. We're in the middle of this Living Story series. We're reading through God's Word together. This week we landed in the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and in the book of Ecclesiastes, what we find is this, the author, he actually wrote this book 3,000 years ago. His name is Solomon. 
He was the king of Israel. He was David's son, Solomon. History tells us that this man named Solomon, he was the richest, wisest, most powerful man in the entire world. Scholars actually believe that Solomon was worth somewhere uh, in the range of two trillion dollars. Two trillion dollars. Now, can you try to wrap your mind around what it means to have two trillion dollars in your bank account? I actually Googled earlier uh, this morning uh, the richest people in the world. And right now, you know, give or take what the stock market does, the richest people in the world are worth around $186 billion. So a fraction of the amount of two trillion dollars. The Bible tells us that people would come from all over the world to learn uh, from Solomon and his wisdom, that he knew everything about everything, uh, that he was king in Israel during uh, the golden age where he built, uh, it was during his reign that he built the holy temple of God, where God himself, his manifest presence was dwelling in his temple, where uh, he, he built the, the royal palace. He built the fortified walls around the city, strengthening and protecting the city of Jerusalem. He ruled over all the kings from the Euphrates River to the land of the Philistines to the border of Egypt. Now, what's, what's most interesting, I think, about this book, uh, Ecclesiastes, is that it's this book just like full of wisdom and deep personal reflection. It, it's this book that describes one man's personal journey, Solomon's journey to find the meaning of life, to, to find happiness, to, to find what truly uh, would fulfill him, to solve the problem of human emptiness, to enlighten himself to what's truly and actually like valuable and profitable. And he did all this by conducting this like super elaborate social experiment. And so if you can imagine, just, just consider the smartest, you know, wisest, richest man, most powerful person in the entire world, devoting everything that he had, devoting all of his time, all of his energy, all of his resources to, uh, you know, finding out and trying to, you know, really uncover the meaning of life. That's what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. I want to give you just an example, a little excerpt of what I'm talking about. If you turn in your Bible to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, starting verse 13, this is what Solomon says. This is uh, a part of him explaining to his readers what he went through. He said, look, I devoted myself. I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven, everything being done under the sun. So Solomon, he read and he studied and he looked around and he asked all these questions. And then if you go into chapter two, starting at verse one, it says this, I said to myself, come on, let's, let's try pleasure. Let's, let's look for all, or let's look for the good things in life, all that the world had to offer King Solomon. It says in verse three, after much thought, I decided to cheer myself with wine. And while still seeking wisdom, I clutched at foolishness. In this way, I tried to experience the only happiness most people find during their brief life in this world. It says in verse 4, I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens and parks. This would have been all characteristic of Solomon's royalty and just the extremity of his nobility, right? Filling them with all kinds of fruit trees. I built reservoirs to collect the water to irrigate my many flourishing groves. I bought slaves, he says in verse 7. Both men and women and others were born into my household. So I literally owned these people. I also owned large herds and flocks more than any uh, of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver, 
uh, and gold, the treasure of many kings and provinces. The Bible says that he collected so much silver, like he was worth so much. He was so rich that silver in general was basically worthless in Jerusalem. Uh, says, uh, second half of verse 8, I hired wonderful singers, both men and women. So he filled his home, he filled his life with music and song and had many beautiful concubines. In fact, if you read somewhere else in the Bible, it says that he had seven, check this out, 700 wives and 300 concubines. So he was balancing relationships with, you know, roughly a thousand women. Good luck with that. Uh, but it says, I had everything a man could desire. Verse 9, it says, so I became greater than, or I surpassed, uh, you know, I prospered beyond all who had lived in uh, Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, Solomon says, anything I wanted, I would take. It was at my grasp. It was at my fingertips. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. So here's the, you know, the richest, wisest, most powerful man in the entire world conducting this grand social experiment that lasts for 12 chapters where he pursues everything thought to give uh, life and meaning and fulfillment, no pleasure was left unturned. Nothing was withheld from him. Everything he ever wanted, everything that his heart desired, that his flesh desired, he took hold of. Now, listen, you know, you would assume, as he shares just a brief example of this in chapter two, you would assume that somewhere along the way, in all of his wisdom and fame and fortune and power and possessions and success in all the wine and all the food that he could consume in all the women he had to entertain him and all the you know palaces and the homes to live in the gardens and the vineyards and the people and the flocks that bore his name and all of his work in all of his endless enjoyment and pleasure that he would somewhere along the way that he would have come close to solving this great mystery, that he would have figured it all out, that he would have found some sense of like true meaning and fulfillment for the soul. But, but check this out. Check out what he says in verse 11. This is like the conclusion, and this is uh, thematic to the entire book. It says in verse 11, but as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, so as he just stepped back, as he looked at all of his time, his money, his resources, everything that he'd been doing, all of his pursuits, as he stood back and he looked at it all, it says, it was all so meaningless. It was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Have you ever tried? Have you ever tried to chase the wind? Uh, I think that's kind of a ridiculous uh, question to ask. I mean, I think you can do a lot of things with the wind. You can see the effects of the wind. You can feel the wind. You can certainly, you know, you can hear the wind. You, you know, technology nowadays, we can capture the wind in many ways. We use our turbines and our windmills and all of that other, you know, scientific techn technological stuff in order to use the wind to our advantage. But, but chasing the wind, uh, that just seems impossible, right? I was uh, at um, I was on this hike the other day with my family, and uh, and I was thinking about this sermon. I was thinking about what I had just been reading through scripture, and um, suddenly there was like this breeze. There was all this wind, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try chase the wind. And I went about a quarter of a second, and then I was like, you know what? This is stupid. Like that's not gonna happen. It's just, it's impossible to chase the wind. Actually, Jesus tells us in uh, the book of John chapter 3, the reason why it's impossible to chase the wind is because the wind blows wherever it wants to. No one knows where it comes from or where it's going. So, so attempt to chase the wind, uh, it's, it's meaningless 
as Solomon is telling us. This is the picture that he's painting. It's, it's all void of any sort of real purpose. It leads to no particular destination. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. And so what Solomon is saying, as he's saying, look, it's all chasing the wind. It's at the end of the day, all of my efforts, like all of my pursuits, all of my success and all of my accomplishments, it was all so meaningless. It was all so unfulfilling. It all meant nothing. He says in chapter 1, verse 8, he says it this way, Everything is wearisome beyond description. No matter how much we see, we are never satisfied. No matter how much we hear, we are not content. Now, hear me. I think it's, um, you know, it's easy to read through Scripture in general uh, and disengage from it uh, and consider them just like unique stories to that particular individual. It's easy for us to detach ourselves from Solomon's story because here's this man who lived 3,000 years ago who had this unique uh, you know, circumstance. He's the richest, wisest, most powerful man in the world. It's, this is nothing that we can relate to, right? But I, I would argue, I would argue, that you and I, we cannot uh, disengage here. We must lean into this conversation and to this story because we're no different than Solomon. You know, like Solomon, we are all, as we saw in that video with all these familiar faces, all these, you know, celebrities, uh, we're all in search for meaning, that we're all in search for happiness and fulfillment. And though we may not be the richest person or the most wise or the most powerful, our pursuits are pretty similar. You know, the world tells us to trust in our money because our money is our ticket to freedom, to happiness. The, the world will say, look, get into a relationship. That's the way you can satisfy your need for love. Or, you know, we think that pornography or alcohol or drugs or, uh, you know, anything medicinal, that's what's going to gratify the cravings of our flesh. Or we think that our sexuality or our gender will give us our true identity or our work and our education or our family is going to give us what really we belong for in our purpose. Or maybe it's like material possessions, like the things that we own, the things that, uh, you know, like a new car or uh, a new house or, um, you know, uh, uh, the latest technology in our hands. That's what's going to bring us comfort. Uh, or you think about like religion in general. We chase after religion and we chase after working towards these things because it will bring some sort of understanding or enlightenment. And I would say, look, though... Though all of these things, as we chase after them, though they may satisfy us temporally or at least for a little while, there comes a point, as it was with King Solomon, that we take a step back and we look at all of our stuff. We look at everything we've accumulated. We look at our accomplishments and all of our efforts and our pursuits. And I think there's no denying it. We realize at some point that it's doing nothing for our soul that we're still empty, that there's still this void, that there's still this brokenness and this thirst and this disappointment. We look at all of our stuff and we're like, man, at the end of the day, it feels like I'm still just, I'm chasing after the wind. And so I guess the, you know, the, the question that I wrestle with, and maybe you've wrestled with from time to time, maybe you're wrestling with right now is like, well, why? Like, why, why couldn't Solomon solve this, you know, this mystery and this problem with everything at his fingertips? He still couldn't solve the problem of human emptiness. Why, why can't I manufacture some sort of meaning, some sort of fulfillment in my life? Well, the Bible makes it really clear why we can't. And the reason why is because of our own sin. Uh, if, if we rewind to the book of Genesis, what we see is that, you know, each of us, we were created, humanity was created in the perfect love and in the perfect image of our God. That, you know, uh, another part in, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon in his wisdom, he says that God put eternity deep into the hearts and into the souls of man. That you and I were created in His perfect love to be perfectly fulfilled. 
To live in a world of perfect harmony, of perfect peace, of perfect glory, of perfect completion with God. But the bad news is that because God loved us so much, He gave us free will to choose for ourselves. We could worship Him. We could worship ourselves. We chose to sin against God, to go our own way. And in our free will and in our sin, um, this is what caused a great divide or this great chasm between the holy creator and his unholy people, his creation. The Bible tells us that this sin is is what leads to our death, this spiritual death, a separation of our true and original purpose and uh, fulfillment and meaning. Uh, the book of Isaiah explains it this way, that it's like our souls in our sin. Our souls are living in empty chaos. I think a good illustration comes from the book of Micah chapter 6, verses uh, 14 through 15. He says, you will eat but never have enough. Your hunger pangs and emptiness will remain. And though you try to save your money, it'll come, uh, it'll come to nothing in the end. You will save a little, but I will give it to those who conquer you. You will plant crops, but not harvest them. You will press your olives, but not get enough oil to anoint yourselves. You will trample the grapes, but not get no, or, but get no juice uh, to make your wine. And so it's just an illustration. It's, It's a picture of our sin that leads to our spiritual death, to this soul of emptiness, of desolation, of despair. And so I guess that leads to the next question. Okay, so like, what do we do about it? Is that something that we're just stuck in forever? Always searching, always longing, always thirsting for fulfillment and purpose and meaning? Well, the good news is, is that uh, in Solomon's effort, he actually eventually found the answer. After he exhausted all of his time and his energy and his resources in humility, uh, You know, he dropped his pride. He dropped it all. And in repentance, it says in verses uh, 13 of chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, this is just the sum of it all. He says, that's the whole story. That's it. That's all I did. I searched for it. I studied it. I did this huge experiment with everything. I basically owned everything. I tried everything. Here now is my final conclusion. This is it. Fear God. Pastor Rowe, last week he uh, talked about what that word fear really looks like. To to revere God. To to be in awe of God. To posture your heart and to honor God. So fear God and obey His commands. Honor and obey. For this is everyone's duty. That's my final conclusion to fear God, to honor and obey God. He, he says in chapter two, of, uh, or chapter 2, verse 25, he says, For who can eat and who can enjoy anything apart from Him, apart from God? God gives wisdom. God gives knowledge. God gives joy and happiness and peace to those who please Him. So what Solomon came to realize And the bottom line truth for each of us to walk away with today is this, that all of life's pursuits are totally meaningless without God. That all of life's pursuits are totally meaningless. It's chasing after the wind without God in the center. That there's no such thing as our true purpose and true fulfillment apart from God. That it's all toil, that it's all temporal, that it's all fleeting, it's all finite. That nothing on earth can buy our soul's satisfaction. That no power and no possessions will satisfy. That it's all just cheap substitutes for, you know, in comparison to the infinite sovereignty to the infinite um, mercy and grace of God and God alone. And so I think that this is just a reminder that we all need to hear today because, you know, you search deep within your soul. You know this to be true. 
that the more money we have, the more, you know, we just want more of it. The more we devote ourselves to these relationships and, uh, you know, all, all these ways of fulfilling, you know, this need for love and acceptance and identity, you know, it fails. It falls short. That everything new, it'll eventually become old and used. That whatever is shiny now, that whatever is valuable to us now, that whatever may satisfy us in the moment or satisfy the cravings of our flesh in this moment, it'll all fade, right? It's all chasing after the wind. It's all void of any sort of true purpose. It, it may tickle the senses momentarily and temporally, but it won't satisfy for eternity. That all of life's pursuits are totally meaningless apart from God, without God. And I think this is also a reminder for us is that as this is all focused and as it's all centered on Jesus, if we fast forward to the New Testament, what we see is that God, He loved you so much. That He loves us so much that He actually chose to remove our emptiness, this void in our soul by sending His, his one and only Son, Jesus, the Savior of the world, that though the curse of sin was death and emptiness, Jesus came, Jesus came to empty Himself so that He may redeem us, that He may restore us and fill us uh, back to this relationship with the Father. Uh, the, uh, the Apostle Peter, in 1 Peter chapter 1, Verse 18, he puts it this way, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life that you inherited from your ancestors. And it was not paid with mere gold or silver. It wasn't paid with what was valuable to the world, which lose their value. In verse 19, it was the precious blood of Christ, God's one and only Son, Jesus, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, God chose him as your ransom long before the world began. But now, in these last days, he has been revealed for your sake. You see, it's through the perfect life of Jesus, the perfect Son of Man and the perfect Son of God, who lived the perfect, sinless, holy life. It's through his perfect death on the cross where the wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. It's through uh, the perfect resurrection of Christ, defeating death in the grave, defeating the curse of death, uh, defeating uh, all that Satan had put on his shoulders that he was up against, uh, his perfect ascension into heaven, that those who honor that those who believe, that those who are obedient to Christ are redeemed, that we're set free, that we're made whole, that we're restored. Jesus, he, he speaks to his followers, his disciples. He says in Matthew 16, verse 25, he says, look, if, you're, if you try to hang on to your life, if you're hanging on to all this stuff, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, if you honor me, if you believe in me, if you surrender to me, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world? What do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? See, Jesus, he came to give us life and life to the full, abundant life, as we read in John Chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus came to make our lives, our broken, empty lives, complete again. To fill the void in our soul. To fill the emptiness. To fill the thirst and the hunger. One time, Jesus, uh, he met this, I'm going to close it with this. He, he met this woman at a well. Uh, and this woman at, at this well, she was like King Solomon, and she was like us who, you know, were hungry and thirsting for meaning and for uh, purpose. Um, she was chasing after the wind. Her, her soul was longing for satisfaction and fulfillment in all the wrong 
places. Uh, her preferred method was in you know men and in relationships. She had been married five times, and the man that she was with now she wasn't married to. And so Jesus, he approaches this woman, they have this conversation, and in the middle of this conversation, he says to her, he looks her in the eye, and I believe he's saying to each of us today, he said, look, if you only knew, if you only knew the gift of God, or the gift God has for you, and who you were speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And the woman's like, what do you mean living water? Like, is there such thing as like, you, you know, I'm, I can't not drink water and then eventually thirst again. Like, what is this living water? It says, it says in verse 14, he says, those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And so listen, friends, listen. In the midst of our longing, in the midst of your searching, in the midst of uh, your pain and your frustration and your disappointment, in the midst of all that the world has to offer, know that there is Jesus that all of our pursuits, they're all meaningless without Jesus at the center. And so may we just drink, like may we drink deep of the well of living water, of life and of salvation in God's one and only Son, Jesus. I wanna end our time together with communion. And I believe, you know, this is a means for us. You know, the Bible calls communion a sacrament where, where God really meets us here, here, where, you know, we move from this place of information to transformation, where we make these decisions to come to the table with God. Uh, and uh, like Solomon, to humble ourselves before him, to repent of our sin to repent of those things that we're holding on to and to just simply turn towards our Savior, Jesus. I believe right now that you and me, you know, as we're sitting here, me in my office, you at home um, or wherever you may be, this is our opportunity to consider, like, where am I chasing after the wind? Like, wh what am I pursuing uh, to try to find meaning, to try to find purpose, to try to find fulfillment and identity? And where am I falling short? And in those things, may I now surrender them to Christ Jesus. May I now declare that Jesus, Jesus is enough. That Jesus is, uh, that his grace is sufficient. That Jesus is my supply. That Jesus is all I need. That Jesus is my comfort. That Jesus is my strength. That Jesus is my Lord, my Savior, and my salvation. May we drink deep from the well of living water. I'm gonna read this uh, communion liturgy, similar to uh, our giving liturgy we did at the beginning. This is another liturgy that we've put together to just you know, recognize the significance and the reason why we enter into a time of communion. So you can get your elements ready. I'm gonna read this over us and then we're gonna uh, uh, engage and encounter Christ through communing with Him. Communion is a sacred and holy act of worship. It is in this holy moment that we reflect on the atoning work of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and also the hope of His future glory. Jesus modeled this sacrament and commanded His followers to repeat it for the sake of remembrance, repentance, thanksgiving, and fellowship between God and His people. We understand that all are invited to this table, but we also recognize it is a sacrament reserved for those who worship Jesus as Lord. Therefore, we do not enter into this communion lightly, but reverently and with admiration. As communion is a divine exchange between heaven and earth. It is at this sacred table that we sit together as a family and are invited to examine ourselves, confess our sin, and participate in the redeeming work 
of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's take a moment to just prepare our hearts to enter into a time of communion together. Jesus, we just love you. We thank you and praise you for being our Lord, for being our living water, for being our hope. Lord, we recognize, we acknowledge that apart from you, all of life's, all of life's pursuits, all of our work, all of our success, all of our stuff, it means nothing. It's, it's temporal. It's finite. But with you, Jesus, our hope is in eternity. With you, Jesus, our soul is satisfied with heaven. And so we come before you with repentance, acknowledging, Lord, that we've done our own thing, that we've turned away from you, that we've sinned in many ways, that we've fallen short. But because you've loved us, Jesus, enough to die on our behalf, to empty of yourself, we accept and we thank you for salvation and fulfillment. You are our treasure. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 24. It says this, On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus uh, took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread of Christ together. Continuing on, it says, In the same way he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes. Let's take the cup of Christ together. Lord, again, we love you, we thank you, we praise you for salvation. We thank you for all that you are, all that you've done. It's all about you. It's all about your glory, your honor, your praise. We come before you, Lord, and we, we honor you, and we ask that you would send us your spirit um, in order to give us courage and the faith and the capacity to continue to obey you. Thank you for giving our life meaning. Thank you for bringing happiness. Thank you for bringing joy um, and peace beyond understanding to guard our hearts and our minds. We love you, Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.